deal. So uh, we call the October 27th board meeting of the North Party Park Agency to order. I'm Greg Lemke, the chair of the board. If the other members and staff would like to introduce themselves. Alexa Dixon Greggs, the secretary. Is that Haider, board member? Shelly Dalquist, city council liaison. Hi, this is Don Bacon. I'm the executive director with Moorhead Public Housing, and I have Tony in my office. She's the housing manager, Tony Vondel. Okay, so the order and roll call has been completed. Are there any agenda amendments? I have no amendments. Okay, and any citizens to be heard at this point in time? Not yet. Not yet, okay. So our first item uh, is approval of minutes. So we um, request board approval of September 22nd, 2020 meeting minutes. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. I second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing now, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Second item is request for approval for payment of bills. Request board approval of payment of bills. Resolution 10 27 2026. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. I second it. I have a motion and a second. Are there any questions, comments about bills? Just a comment so the board's aware. Um, the capital funding um, area is a significant expenditure, and that um, was to replace a number of furnaces um, at the scattered site units. That was in our five year plan. Um, $106,000 went to our air handler unit replacement project, which is underway at Riverview Heights. And then $75,000 of that um, was actually POHP dollars to finalize and, and pay the final bill on the Riverview Heights elevator project. Other than that, they're all very ordinary bills. Okay, any further discussion or comments? Hearing that, all those in favor of approving the bills? Aye. 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 Hang on, motion carries. Don, are you sharing your, because you're sharing your calendar. I'm assuming you wanted the Oh dear, there. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Hold on. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Can you see the okay. agenda? Yep, got it. So now Sorry we're on to business. business, and the first item is the removal of 30 scattered site units from the public housing program. Okay. So, and we have Cynthia Ewan on the line, the consultant that we've been working with on this project. So the memo that I included to the board just kind of summarizes the steps that we've taken um, over the last year plus. Um, I started with September of last year when Greg and I attended the NARO training in Duluth, which had a number of sessions on repositioning options, um, followed by us adopting a strategic plan with reposition as a priority, um, including it in our five-year plan with HUD um, and taking some steps with our capital funding grant dollars um, to do some renovations in the scattered sites. Getting funding to work with Cynthia to look carefully at all the options, um, reviewing budget impacts, looking at different options, doing resident consultation. And then on October 12th, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I did present to the city council. And the way that our application to HUD reads, we are required to go to do resident consultation as well as um, city council consultation prior to a board vote. 
Um, and so the city council did approve both Moorhead Public Housing um, transferring the property over to the Moorhead Affordable Housing LLC, as well as um, supporting our application to HUD. Um, and I did receive a letter of support from the mayor today that would be included as part of our application to HUD. And so um, I also included in the board packet, um, not only the resolution that I'm bringing before the board today, but also the um, information that went before um, council member Dahlquist and other city council members on October 12th. So you could see that background information and what we communicated to the city council. Um, the resolution that I have before the board um, is language that's taken directly out of the um, SAC application and SAC stands for the, the is it special application center, Cynthia? Yes, I believe so. Acronyms um, with HUD. And so if the board is ready to approve us moving forward, our next steps would be to complete that application, which I will say it's a very extensive application. I've started to work on it. It'll probably take me a couple weeks um, to get it all completed. Um, and then we would have the field office do a review prior to it going to the special applications unit of HUD. Um, and I did put some, some tentative dates um, so that you could see those next steps um, in the process. So that's a little bit about, uh, I know this is something we've talked a lot about, but it is a significant step forward for the agency. So also very open if there's any questions that board members have about the process or about us proceeding. Any questions for Don? Questions, comments for Don or Cynthia? I know it's been a lot of hard work, and if you look at least September, you know, it's been over a year, and it's been a lot of hard work for Don, especially in working with Cynthia, so it's very much appreciated. Yeah, it's exciting to see all the progress, so good work. Thank you, and yeah, I feel like we're transitioning from like the phase one of the hard work to the phase two of the hard work. <laughs> um, because the second phase will be a lot of close work with Clay County HRA um, to make that as, as seamless of a transition as possible. And um, I feel really good about um, how we're looking at that. Tony's been doing a lot of work um, preparing information um, with residents so that, again, it can be a very smooth process for them. So that'll be good. Anything else for Don? Questions, comments? I don't have any. Looks like you're going to get off kind of easy, Don. <laughs> yeah, All well, right, I'll take prepared. it. Oh, yeah. We, well, it shows there's been a lot of hard work and, and you've kept us informed throughout the process. So. There's no surprises or anything for us. So it's great. Again, appreciate all the work. All right. Uh, if there's no comments or questions, then I'll entertain a motion to approve that resolution to remove those 30 scattered site units from public housing program. I will make a motion to approve. Zad, are you still with us? Oh, no. I see him. You do see him or don't? I don't I see do. him. Yes, yes okay. I second it. All right. <laughs> Thank oh. you. So we have a motion now. You got a helper there. We have a motion <laughs> and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So we'll move on to item B, 2021 utility allowances for public housing. Okay, so this item is one that comes before the board every year and it is specific to the public housing program. So 
you know, again, we need to continue to do the things we do for the scattered sites until that change is approved by HUD and actually implemented. So this really is more about scattered sites within the public housing program. But um, we do have a system in place where depending on someone's income, um, there are ways for them to access a utility allowance to help offset the cost of their utilities. And so every year, um, and I should say, Robin in our office does all of the hard work um, and puts this memo together basically for me and I just review it, but she crunches a ton of numbers on actual costs of utilities at all of those sites and puts together an average utility cost so that when someone does qualify for a utility allowance, we have good solid data specific to those units to plug in. So we're basically bringing these before the board to approve for the 2021 utility allowance rates for the different sites. Any questions or comments for Don on the utility allowances? So what are these utility allowances? Are, are we paying for the utility for what? So the, the residents are responsible for their utilities. Um, they get a bill from like Moorhead Public Service or Xcel Energy. Um, but we, when we're doing their rent calculation, we look at the cost of utilities and their income. And particularly for people who are extremely low income, uh, maybe they have no income, that could put them in a situation where they qualify for some um, funding towards their utilities. Um, this can be called going into like negative rent. So maybe they're at zero rent, but they're so poor that given the utility class, we actually cut a check to Moorhead Public Service or Xcel Energy to cover a portion of their utilities. And I'm just going to pause and look at Tony to see if I'm, am I communicating that accurately enough? Okay, because Tony works with it much more closely than I do. So some residents may not have a utility allowance that applies to them because their income is higher, but others um, who are um, very, very low income, um, we may be you know, paying a portion of their utilities to help offset that expense. Thank you, Don. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the 2021 utility allowances. I make a motion to approve the utility of 2020, 21. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. There's no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item C is Transitional Apartments Program 2021 Agreement. So we have three transitional units in our high rise that we tell HUD to take them offline out of the public housing program. Um, and we use them for special use and HUD approves that. Um, and so we basically don't get funded for those three units from HUD and instead we get funded through the local adult mental health initiative, which you may hear called BCOW. It stands for Becker, Clay, Ottertail, Wilkin counties. Um, these transitional units are primarily utilized by Clay County. Uh, there's another transitional program in Fergus Falls through another agency. Um, and the purpose of the program is for people with significant mental illness who maybe are homeless and have a history of more chronic homelessness, um, where the, the case managers they're working with need more time to do planning for them to get them permanently housed. And perhaps being in a shelter or, or another more precariously housed situation could do more harm than good. Um, given their mental health issues. And so um, the Becker Clay Ottertail Wilkin Adult Mental Health Initiative basically rents three units from us. Um, and then um, they run a transitional apartment program out of those units. This has been done for a very long time, um, I believe since 2002. Um, so you can see the history of rates. Um, this year, um, I did talk with the BCOW Executive Committee 
who looks at the budget that they receive from DHS and how that funding is allocated. They're not in a position um, to give us any kind of an increase this year. I'm recommending that the board approve the same rates um, so that the program can continue. Um, however, I will be you know, communicating with them that we can't go without a rate increase forever. Um, and so continue to stay in conversation on that topic. Um, at this point, the difference between the funding from public housing and the funding we're getting from um, the adult mental health initiative, um, I don't see, you know, it, it can vary based on occupancy rates and I don't see a loss that's concerning for the agency. And that's, you know, that combined with the value of the program is why I would recommend that we continue for 2021. Okay. Any other comments, questions for Don? Does, does it has a, a business background or a still community service background? The background of who? The background of these steps, those units, when you are paying for them. So does it has a, a kind of like a, a business background or? A, a scale community health background supporting people who need right away a unit because of those reasons that you mentioned. Yeah, let me know if I didn't catch your question due to the technology issues, but I, um, the funding comes from the county. Um, they just pay for rent and then um, um, Lakes and Prairies Cap LP, which is uh, the local um, community action agency, they provide supports to people living in those units. So it's focused around like social service supports and that kind of a program to help people transition and stay healthy so that they can be permanently housed. So they'll be working with the people living in those units to find a permanent housing option um, so that they can move from that unit into permanent housing. Does that help with that? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions? If, if not, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye, opposed? Motion carries. Item D is 2021 board meeting schedule. So a few things about this. Um, one is if board members need time to look at their calendars, we can easily put this on the agenda for next month or if we wanted to consult with Michael. Um, but we wanted to at least get the conversation going about setting our meetings for the coming year. We typically meet the fourth Tuesday. Um, so the calendar doesn't really change a whole lot, but we always look ahead at when those Tuesdays fall and how that might look with holidays. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is we do have the video conference until further notice. We just have no idea when we'll be in a position to safely meet in person. And so we'll just have to kind of take that issue as it goes. Um, and particularly that we utilize our community rooms and we want to be careful about people coming in to the building and you know minimize that as much as possible for our residents. Um, Tony mentioned the email that she sent out to all of you. She called out that December 28th date. Um, this year in 2020, we're meeting, I believe a week earlier in December to kind of get away from that holiday time. Um, when we look at the calendar a year out from now in December of 2021, um, the fourth Tuesday, our usual meeting time lands on that December 28th. Um, Christmas Day falls on the Saturday before, so it would be the following Tuesday. Um, and we thought that might uh, make sense to just stay with that fourth Tuesday for the December meeting. Um, but we're very open to, you know, obviously whatever works best for the board, um, if you'd rather meet earlier. Um, the only other thing I would call out is I believe, I believe is June on the fourth Tuesday? Or did that work out? I might have to look at my calendar real quick. 
sorry, I should have looked at this earlier. In June, sometimes we meet a week earlier because of, I have a vacation that stands. And yeah. this time around, this time around, it's just on the fourth Tuesday, I believe. Oh, I'm in 2020. Hold on. Okay, so in this June of 2021, we just get to meet on the fourth Tuesday. That actually worked out. So I believe these are all fourth Tuesdays at this point. I guess I would I would suggest or recommend that we switch that December 28th one. That just seems between Christmas and New Year's kind of a busy week or people are gone if they can travel, I guess, or whatever. move it up a week if that works yeah we could meet on the 21st um and that would be the tuesday before christmas is on a saturday that year so it'd be a tuesday before then you're getting out of that between christmas yeah, and yeah. new year's issue yeah i think we should do that as well yeah, that does work for me too. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion uh, with the one change, changing December to the 21st. I'll move to um, change the date from 28th to the 21st in 2021. I second this. Okay, we have a motion, a second, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Do we move on to other business? So I neglected to include one memo in this board packet. It's not an item that you're voting on. It's more of an informational, um, but I can bring that up real quick so you can just look at it. That's not the right one. Sometimes the share function is still not so smooth for me. <laughs> Let me try again. Okay, can you see that? It's a memo called flat rent requirement. Yeah, I see, yeah, I, I see it. It's not, it's a little hard to read, but it's okay. Is it? Okay. What I can do is I could include this in the November board packet. Um, it is more of an informational item. And the reason for that is our admissions and um, continued occupancy policy already dictates what our flat rent amounts um, what levels they're set at, and they're always automatically set at 80% of the fair market rent for our area. Um, fair market rents are specific to geographic areas. For us, it's the Fargo-Moorhead Metropolitan Statistical Area, um, and HUD releases fair market rents every year. And so we recently got the 2021 fair market rents, and so then we adjust our flat rent accordingly. And you might be like, what is flat rent? Um, it's a public housing thing, um, and it basically is if somebody's income, they get to choose if their income is going to be 30%, if they're going to pay rent, I'm sorry, they choose their rent at either 30% of their income or the flat rent, and people will basically take whichever one works better for them. Um, and so it tends to be for higher income um, residents. We don't have a lot of people using flat rent. Um, but it does apply to some. Um, I'm just looking to see if I put in there how many people are currently using flat rent. I want to say it's around, It's. I don't think it's more than 10. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't have a major impact. But we always, every year, just so that you know what the rates are that we're applying, 
Um, so I put in the flat rent amounts for 2020, um, how they're changing for 2021. Um, and you can also see the fair market rent rates. Um, some years there's an increase, some years there are, is not. Um, there can never be more than a 35% increase in any given year, according to HUD. And so we always check that as well. And that's never happened. Um, so any questions on flat rent? Again, this doesn't require board approval, but it's something you know we want to provide to the board as an informational piece. So the flat the flat rent, how 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 like how much is the difference between the flat rent and the thirty percent from their you know from their payment? Does it is that another way of like supporting the the families or yeah, um, I would say if someone is choosing flat rent, it's because 30% of their income is more. So it is a, a function within public housing that is beneficial to people. Um, it doesn't exist in the Section 8 program. They just pay the 30% of their income. Um, so it's more of a public housing regulation. And they do get the option in our policy, it says, you know, and Tony will work with them on that rent calculation and she'll just show them, you know, they can see the two numbers and decide. Any other questions on flat rent? Nope. None for me. My next item was just on Wi-Fi options. Just wanted to get some feedback from the board. Um, we had this in our strategic plan just to look in and see a little more closely people's access to internet. Um, particularly right now, it's such a critical lifeline um, and it will continue to be important even beyond COVID. Um, so we just did a little research just to kind of see what are residents saying about internet access, um, what options do we have in our buildings to potentially expand access for people, what are other housing authorities doing. So I gathered some information I wanted to kind of walk through with the board and just get your input and guidance um, about some potential next steps. So the first thing we did is we did survey residents just to um, ask some questions of them about internet access. Um, we did get a pretty strong response rate um, and a number of people are looking for better internet where they have, they are paying for internet, um, but they're paying kind of the market rate and they're looking for better options. Um, some do not have internet but we did have a lot of interest. Um, one of the things we did look into is with Sparklight or Cable One, we currently have a bulk rate for cable. And so I asked our representative to pull together some information about what if we did a bulk rate for internet. And basically a bulk rate is where the price for the resident drops way down um, compared to what they could get in the market. Um, in exchange for us only going through that provider. Um, and with internet, there was an option where we could get a bulk rate and they could even work with another provider, but our coax line, which is like the way the building is wired, would be specific for um, that internet option. Unfortunately, the numbers that I got from Sparklight are pretty substantial and they commit the agency to paying whether or not the residents decide they want internet or not. Um, and because of that, I do not recommend we go that route um, because it's just too big of a risk for the agency. Um, if, we, if it turned out where a lot of residents decided they didn't want internet, we would be locked into 
a contract where we're paying a significant amount of money for something that people are not using. And I tried to negotiate like contract terms to like terminate the contract should, you know, things, mm -hmm. the business not be there. Um, but they weren't interested in that. And I think the reason for that is the reason that they can offer such low rates is about that guaranteed business. So the next thing I looked at was what about our community rooms? Would there be a way, um, what would it cost for us to offer Wi-Fi in the community room? I did get some rates on that, which, um, you know, they that is one where we can't pass any expense onto the residents um, where we would just have to pay for it. And it would just be open for people to use in the community room. Um, the cost they gave me, you know, was much more manageable. Um, that said, I think if the board was interested, I'd like to try to negotiate a little harder to get it down a little bit more. Um, the person I was talking to, I think there's another person that I could potentially talk to, but their preliminary number was um, looking around $3,000 per year for the two community rooms at Riverview Heights and Sharpview. So that's something I think might be more um, tenable for the organization. When I asked other housing authorities what they're doing around Wi-Fi access, none of them were doing a bulk rate situation. So again, I think it makes sense to rule that out. Um, we did have some that were offering Wi-Fi in community rooms and public spaces um, at the housing authority's expense. So that is a more common scenario. And then there were a number of other housing authorities that are not doing anything where they're kind of saying it's between the resident and their internet provider. However, their buildings are set up in a way where people can access internet and pay for it, which ours are as well. Um, so again, I think what, based on what I've looked at, I think some good next steps might be pushing a little harder on that community room number if you guys are interested in that option. Um, and also, I think talking with another internet provider just to see what options are available for residents where it would still be between the resident and the provider, but maybe our service coordinator could get a little better handle on what those options are so that she could help not sell people, but just facilitate information for people who might be like, I don't know where to start, you know, what are my options? She could at least help, you know, um, get them connected with information um, so that they know what their options are. So any thoughts on that for the board? When you say community rooms done, is the, um, at the high rise, does that include that seating area or whatever you wanna call it when, when you first walk in where there's couches or chairs? And... Yeah, we call that the lobby. That's a good question. I could ask about that. Okay. I, I guess I was just thinking the straight up community rooms, but I bet there would be a way because they just adjust it for distance and it's not that far from the community room um, where we could include both the lobby and the community room. And can you get contracts for that? I mean, because those, you know, it just seems like those utilities tend to creep up in prices or did you have any discussion about that, like getting a two or three or year contract to keep the cost? Yeah, I think their um, their standard is like a three year contract. Okay. <clears throat> and if we merged it with our cable bulk rate contract right now, that is a three year contract. So logistically that and administratively, that might be easier just to build it in with that. So we're not tracking another contract sequence sure. okay so i have a couple of questions so for the for the first one for the helping the helping them with the internet i like i don't know like me it just comes to my mind like a kind of like a, a, a internet is one of the uh, uh, you know the individual freedom that we you know that each person you know may prefer a different agency and you know internet and stuff like that so anyway uh, so that's why i was like you know looking at that i was thinking i mean if instead of you know instead of spending our money over there if we could spend that money on in another way you know benefiting you know 
lowering their rent or something like that. Anyway, so then that choice will be theirs to decide, you know, which, you know, which agency to connect with for their internet and stuff like that. So anyway, so the second one is the idea of the, uh, the, the community rooms that you discussed. And you already said that you did a survey for, to ask for their opinions. And I was wondering if you could ask them again, uh, see how much they use those community rooms in, in how big are those community rooms? And in, if, it, if, if, if we see that, you know, presidents are using those community rooms and, you know, they could be, you know, it could be a beneficial to them. And also if those community rooms are big, then I am with it to, to go in that side. But if, if the, with the two choices, if the community rooms are not big, and not many people are using the community room in, in the survey, kind of survey asking them it will comes up. In that case, we don't want to spend money on something that will not, will not have more towards our residents. Right. I mean, those are good points because if we did go into, say, a three year contract for Wi Fi in the community rooms, we'd still be in that situation where if people didn't use the Wi Fi at all, in the community room, we would be kind of throwing those resources away. Um, and it is challenging. So we could do another survey more specific to the community room and the usage. Um, we know that our community rooms are used um, for the most part. Right now, um, our community room at Sharpview is closed due to COVID, um, at least for a couple of weeks. But um, we know our community rooms by and large are utilized. I think we could try to obtain some more information to better predict our people would people use free Wi-Fi. Um, you know, in terms of choice, um, that we wouldn't have a lot of resources to kind of spread around to people to make other choices because it would only be around two thousand a, a year total, um, and we can't lower rent um, just given the regulations in the public housing program. Um, in their units, my understanding is they can use different internet providers of their choice. Yeah, I mean, like my comment was not, you know, not directly cut from their rent, but there's always, you know, there's always other resources or other ways that we could, you know, it, you know, it's the only concern, you know, like, as you already mentioned something, you know, the idea of the coronavirus we have, you know, and one of the, you know, the, you know, people are social distancing and stuff like that. Anyway, so just I said to put it on the table and to, to, to see, like you guys to see. It. I like the community room option, too, because to cut those costs, if they want Internet and don't want to pay for it, they still have the option of receiving it um so at least we're providing an option if they don't like the providers or if it's too expensive um they can cut costs that way but they also have the option of paying for something that they do that they specifically want so i think it's kind of best of both worlds that way and at a relatively low cost to us thank you for that feedback azat and alexa I think given that feedback, um, we might do a follow up communication first, just to kind of update them on we, you know, we did the survey, what are we doing about it? Right. Um, and, and in that we could say we're taking a closer look at the community room. Um, and so we want more information about would you use free Wi Fi if it was available to you within the community room? Um, and if those numbers are strong, perhaps um, going back to the internet provider and seeing what is the best possible lowest rate that we could get. Sounds good. I just, uh, the, um, the community rooms are never like, they're not locked at midnight or something, are they? So if somebody wanted to get in there anytime they could, okay. Yep, they're open all the time. Okay. Thanks for that feedback. 
you guys ready for executive director updates? Yes. Okay. Let's see if I can find my notes. Uh, my first update was regarding Maple Court. Um, I recently met with Greg and Michael to go through things in more detail, but wanted to make sure the whole board had an update on where the status of things are. Um, I think I last talked to you about how we were getting a second opinion on the on some capital needs issues with the shingles and the concrete um, because we're looking at the value of the property in terms of determining a purchase price. Um, so we did obtain that other opinion and that was extremely helpful in, in helping us pinpoint um, what the issues are and what we would need to plan for um, if we were to purchase the property. So we do have kind of revised estimates on that. So that was a big step forward. Um, the other issue is on financing um, and looking at different financing options. Um, we have heard from the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency um, that it looks very likely that Moorhead Public Housing would be able to assume the 0% MARIF loan. Uh, MARIF is a particular program within um, the units. It only applies to four units, but it has to do with um, more rent rent restrictions for people who um, have um, recently transitioned out of the MFIP, formerly AFDC welfare program. Um, and so we would be operating that program, not the city, because our side of the units would be rental units and MARIF by nature is a rental program. Um, but that gives us some options with the MARIF loan. Um, that decision would be finalized through MHFA with their committee process and such, but it's looking very positive that we could assume that 0% loan, which is good for us. And then we've also been in conversation with the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund um, about some financing options. And so I'm going to be setting up a call to dig into that with them a little bit more, um, but it does appear that there's a good interest rate that they'd be willing to have us lock into for um, like a 25 year period, which is much longer than um, like a 4% interest rate through local banks. Um, so next steps um, for us is probably getting more clear on purchase price with the owner, um, no final decisions. You know, there would be a negotiation, but no final decisions would be made um, until it's made by the board um, in, after discussion in executive session. Um, but getting clear on that purchase price and then getting clear on the financing. And then we're going through like a concurrent process of feasibility analysis with the city. And so we kind of have to stay in step with the city as they do their their work on, on the city side of the units, which you know will be done differently in that um, we more at public housing would be managing, doing property management on all 34 units we would own 17 and operate them as rental. The city would own the other 17 and be transitioning them to eventual tenant ownership where the people living there would have this great opportunity for home ownership to purchase the units. Um, so again, I know this has been a very long process. I wanna say it's been a couple of years, um, but we are making incremental steps forward. Um, and that is kind of where we're at, at at this stage. Um, and I'll be connecting also with city staff in the next few weeks to kind of get a read on where they're at in their analysis and how we can kind of bring things together. Any questions on Maple Court right now? Okay, and thank you to Greg and Michael, who's not on the call, but um, just for being there to kind of go through some more specifics with me and asking good questions. So we'll keep kind of moving through that. Um, another update is just some upcoming grant applications. Um, the safety and security grant is one I've mentioned to the board before that I've been watching for, and it was released by HUD. Um, in reading the um, grant instructions, there is no option for contracting for a security guard. They've, that's been done in the past with that grant and they've removed that as, it's an ineligible expense. So that's off the table, but the camera upgrades are on the table. Um, I did check with the 
regional directors group, um, my colleagues with other housing authorities and have learned that that grant is quite competitive and that it's probably gonna be a long shot. Um, for us, for good reasons, because we would be more competitive if we had more crime issues at our property. So that's good that we don't, but I, it, the grant is not, um, uh, the application is rather straightforward. So I think we're gonna throw our hat in and, and just see um, if we get funded. Um, and again, so we've been looking internally at camera upgrades. And then that way, the work that we do to research some options to add cameras and replace cameras, um, I think we could look at other resources if we're not funded. Um, you know, perhaps additional resources that we're getting from Clay County HRA with the transfer. Okay. The Ross grant is another big one that's due November 19th. Um, and that grant is critical because it would renew us for another three years, which would allow us to continue to have a service coordinator on staff. So we're working very diligently on that application and plan to get it in nice and early. <laughs> when do you hear back if you were refunded or not for that one? I have to look um, last year on what the timeline was for that. I know um, our current grant expires April 15th. Um, and with the applications being due in November, I would anticipate a couple of months. Sure. So probably sure. January. Okay. Yeah. That's a really important one. That's a yes. big one. And then finally, um, in the fifth um, special session of the Minnesota State Legislature, they did pass a bonding bill. Yes. And that bonding bill included, you know, a number of things around affordable housing, but looking specifically at more at public housing, um, the POHP program, they did authorize a number of dollars, which is the program we use to pay for elevator renovations. Um, I don't anticipate them releasing an RFP for POHP in the next couple months. I think it might be a little delayed just given a number of things going on with um, MHFA. Um, however, that'll be one that we'll want to keep on our radar. I would really like to see us get a big chunk of money to redo all the windows at the high rise. Mm -hmm. And if you remember with our capital needs assessment, they talked about how you want to prioritize capital needs improvements and building exterior is a big one. In addition to the conversations we had in the board with um, our strategic plan around energy efficiency. Um, and so the windows are pretty old, old. We get a lot of wind here um, in Moorhead. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for cost savings and improvements there. So um, it would probably cost, uh, similar to the elevator project, around a half million dollars. Wow. So big, big dollars where I think the POP grant could really help. And then just a couple other updates on capital improvement projects. Um, the Sharp View roof has been in our five-year plan for a while, um, and we are seeing that that roof, it's its getting time. Um, and I think it's a little sooner than we were thinking, maybe we could stretch it a little further. Um, so I think we'll be putting that out for bid um, very soon um, and probably get that done in the spring, you know, at the latest. So that's on the docket as kind of a next project. Um, and then the scattered sites, we've been doing all the reshingling and a lot of work there. We did have to put some concrete work out for bid again because we didn't get a response from contractors. Um, and unfortunately, I think the reason is um, a lot of the regulations associated with public housing. Um, they just don't want to deal with it if it's not a big enough job. And um, after we reposition, it will be a lot easier to put that bid out because they won't have to deal with all of it. Mm -hmm. However, we're trying to spend as much as we can right before we reposition to kind of get those properties in tip top shape. So it's a little bit of a catch 22, um, but it is out again and we'll see if we get any bites. Um, hopefully we do. Um, it, the budget for it is around $16,000. So um, that's a lot of money, but it's also not like the air handler unit, which is like $200,000. So. We'll keep managing through that. We had an audit last week that went really well, and you'll be meeting with Brian again either in December or January for kind of a full recap of the audit. Those are my updates. Sounds good. All good stuff again. 
Thank you for all your hard work on all of those projects, Maple Court and everything. It's very much appreciated. Anybody else have anything before we adjourn? There's no attorneys any place, right, that I seen or heard from. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. Good to Thanks. see everybody. Take care. Take care.